I am not very well today. I'm in a fair amount of pain. So I am going to do a fairly easy sit down video from here on my sofa. Um, I saw this on Nicole Nook's channel and on the book Leo's channel. They tier ranked every book that they had given five stars. I don't tend to give out stars anymore. I don't find them particularly helpful for my reviews, but I do give stars on Storygraph. So these are all of the books that are five stars on Storygraph, which doesn't mean all my favourite books. I only started rating books there on in 2019. And whilst I have gone back and rated some of my previous favourites, I definitely don't think it's all of them. So I have made a tier list um, and I am not creative with my uh, names for the tiers. Obviously all of these books are books that I have loved, um, but we are dividing them even further. Um, so the top of the list is the tip of the top, which are books that I just think are the best books. Then we have a genuine fave, so favourite books that don't quite reach that tippity top level, um, but are still some of my favourite books. Then we have solid five stars, which are books that I definitely think are five stars, but I don't know if I would call them my favourite books. Um, I feel like that's more of an emotional thing. And then books that I need to reread, books that I gave five stars at the time, um, but I, I, I don't know for certain that I would still give them that, that five stars. And then finally, don't know how it got here, which is um, books that I don't know why I gave them five stars. Um, the first one here is Golden Hill by Francis Bufford, which is historical fiction that's set in the 18th century in New York um, about a man who comes to New York with a load of money and seems to be up to something and the town um, aren't quite sure. It's a small town at the time. It, it is kind of a romp told in the style of the 17th of, of 18th century literature um, and it is kind of dark, funny and definitely atmospheric and enjoyable. I think I would put this in solid five stars. I don't think it's one of my favourite books but I think I can confidently say that it is a, a really good book um, and one worth reading. Uh, next is Rebel Bodies by Sarah Graham, which is a non-fiction book about medical misogyny that goes through various different topics from things that are considered women's health, but also topics of cancer and mental health. Sarah Graham's a journalist who interviews um, like people who are activists, people with lived experience, and people who are researchers and medical professionals as well. I found it very broad. I found it was very trans-inclusive, which a lot of these books don't tend to be. Um, and I found that it was really good. I really enjoyed it. I would put that in a genuine fave. Then we have uh, Bringing Down the House by Tishi Chin, which is set in North London. Um, about a Turkish Cypriot community um, over two time periods about a um, woman whose husband is in prison but needs to bring heroin from Turkey into the UK and then also about that man's daughters. I think, I need, I think I'm going to put this in um, solid five stars. It was a book I really, really loved when I read it, maybe even a genuine fave, but it's also one that I would like to reread at the same time um, because I feel like it was when I was reading so many books that my memory of it isn't 100%, but I definitely really, really loved it. Then we have Inglorious Empire by Shashi Thirur. Shashi Thirur is a um, philosopher, politician, and uh, professor who is a member of the Communist Party in India. Um, and he is talking here about the British Empire. Um, and it, it grew out of a debate he had about reparations to the British Empire, the way people ask him questions and the sort of arguments they make for the British in India um, and his arguments against that. It's very well researched um, and the audiobook was also great because Shashi Thurua has an excellent voice. I think I would put that in solid five stars as well. I think that is one that I can definitely say I thought was really interesting and I really enjoyed but not necessarily a favourite book. The Vegetarian by Han Kang. Um, I really, really love this book. I'm going to put it in a genuine fave as well, not quite the tip of the top because that first section. So it's told, um, it's about a woman who has a dream about um, the death of lots of animals and decides to become vegetarian. And her family are really, really against this because it is going against the grain of the culture. Um, and it's about like control of women and women's bodies. And it's from three different perspectives uh, of her husband, her brother-in-law and her sister. And that first perspective, I did find it quite hard to get into because he is such an annoying terrible character and when it changed perspective the style of the writing changed so I realized that that was intentional which made me enjoy the book um, but at the same time that first off-putting section I think makes it not quite the tip of the top for me because I think there is a way to write annoying characters that isn't so annoying to read. The Dead Wander in the Desert by Roland Eisenbaev I need to reread. Um, it's one I read only a couple of years ago so it's not uh, the distance of time that makes it me need to reread it but it is a um, really chunky historical fiction um, about Kazakhstan um, during the Soviet era um, and it is about this big 
internal sea, this salt lake in Kazakhstan that is, uh, because of irrigation and because of um, nuclear testing, is being poisoned and the people who live around this lake. And it is told in like an oral storytelling style. And whilst I thought it was really impressive and I really enjoyed it, I definitely think I would get more out of it on a reread. Sister Outside about Audrey Lord, I will put that in the tip of the top. This is the only Audrey Lord I have read. I know I definitely need to read more. She is a brilliant um, lesbian black feminist writer um, from the mid-century, um, middle of the 20th century. And this Sister Outsider is a collection of essays that she writes um, about gender and race and the intersection of those two things. The first section is actually her experience going to the Soviet Union in the 1970s, which I found absolutely fascinating. She is a really accessible writer for being so academic and I definitely think one of the like one of my favourite non-fictions and I need to read more Audrey Lord. Then we have The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton which again I think I would put into need to reread. I read this one by listening to it on audiobook a long time ago. It is about a mystery of some disappearing people and some gold in New Zealand during the gold rush era in the 19th century. All of the main central characters are based around the zodiac and everyone else is like moon and planets and things um, but I don't really know anything about the zodiac um, but I really enjoyed the way that the story was told that it built this world um, that the mystery unfolded uh, the way that it went through the different perspectives of these different characters and had such strong voices for them but as I said it was a long time ago it was by audiobook and it's a very long book and all of those things make me feel like I need to reread it and this is The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea by Yukio Mishima and I think I'll put that one in a genuine fave as well I really really enjoyed it. It's a short little book translated from Japanese about a group of boys in post-war Japan who become obsessed with like this feeling like they know that the world is not real and um, that everything is an act and they become obsessed with this one sailor who is sleeping with one of the boys mother um, and they think that he can show them like the ways of the world and then they become disillusioned with that and there is a lot about like masculinity and violence and coming of age um, and fading empires and I really enjoyed it. Next we have the Old Drift by Namwali Sapel. This one is also a genuine fave, but I'm putting it right at the top of a genuine fave. It's almost the tip of the top. This is uh, set in Zambia over the course of 120 years, um, and it's about three families from Zambia, a white family, um, a black family, and a family that of mixed heritage with like uh, Indian heritage and Italian heritage the, and also black heritage so there's, there's a big mix there and it goes from the gra great grandfathers to the grandmothers the mothers and the children um, and it tells basically the story of Zambia and its um, striving for independence um, uh, being colonial under independence under communism um, and off into the future um, with neo-colonialism and like techno-colonialism involved and there is also a swarm a chorus of mosquitoes because like a is a big part of it um, as well and I just thought it was so well done so brilliant such lively characters so funny so really really easy to read um, and really immersive as well there are moments of kind of magical realism and surrealism in it as well I thought it was really brilliant. Uh, then we have The Betrayed by Rihanna Okake Melvin and I would put that around the same place as Namwali Sapal although I think I also need to reread this book. This one is set in the Philippines um, at the end of the Marcos regime and it is about a two sisters who are the daughters of um, some a trade union leader who fought against the Marcos regime and they return to the Philippines because one of the husbands is now running for power and he was like the godson of Ferdinand. Marcos about their like their relationships and about a, a country in under political turmoil and under the the ghosts of the past and the haunting of what has happened and in there are one of the sisters can see ghosts and it's just such an atmospheric book so really sticky and dark and wonderful to read and I really really enjoyed it um, but I do think again I need to reread that one. My name is Lucy Barton by Elizabeth Strout I will put in solid five stars. Um, it is one that I haven't really rethought really about or wanted to revisit but I definitely think it's a really strong book really well written. Um, it is about a woman who is a writer and she is writing about a time when she was in hospital and her mum came to visit her her mum from whom she had been estranged because of a traumatic childhood which also gets referenced so the way that it like layers time and uses storytelling and um like perspective and narrators um i th think is really interesting and really well done it is a very sort of cozy but melancholy book at the same time very beautifully but simply written very lightly written um and i think a really skillful book a really skillful writer but i'm not sure i would say it's one of my favorite books 
Summer Light and then comes The Night. I think I will put in Need to Reread as well because I have, this is by Jon Calvin Stephenson and I read an, his novel, another one of his novels and I didn't like it. So it makes me want to like reconsider was it just the time and place when I read this book because it is a story, it's a novel that is really a collection of short stories, a novel about a small town in rural Iceland um, over the course of a year from um, Arctic day where it's like 24 hours of sun to arctic night 24 hours of darkness it follows various different characters in this community with a slightly strange surreal like um almost magical tinge to it it goes through like the darkness of violence and sexual violence and gender and being watched living in a small town and feeling constantly judged and aware of everyone um and i definitely thought it was like funny and really engaging when i read it but i think i could reread it and see if that remains true empire of pain by patrick radden keith i think i would put that in the tip of the top i think that is also really really good non-fiction it is really um compellingly well written it's about the sackler dynasty um and who um are a very rich family who do a lot of like philanthropy in the arts and sponsoring art galleries and museums and things but who made their money off of um, i think it's like first tranquilizers for, for um housewives and then opiates and um, they made oxycontin which is one of the drivers of the opiate crisis and it is a really really well researched really thorough book about this family kind of slowly dismantling them it starts with this sort of almost rags to riches um like these brothers fighting the way up from like middle class Jewish family up until being in this rich echelons and then it becomes like the machinations of a super rich family and then also like a courtroom drama. There is a lot of drama and tension in the book even though it's non-fiction um, about a topic that could be really dry. The Mercies by Kieran Melwood Hargrave. I do know how it got here but I definitely think I would need to reread. I feel like I wouldn't necessarily fall in love with it again. I don't know what it is. This is set in um, Finnmark, which is an island off the north coast of Norway in the uh, 17th century, about a group of women who are living basically on their own after a tragic fishing accident that killed most of the men, and a witch finder who's been sent to this community, bringing with him his new wife. And it is very atmospheric, and I love that isolated communities thing, and um, it is about like witch hunts and survival, and I do remember really enjoying it, finding it really passionate and gripping, but I'm not 100% sure that it would still work for me. There's this certain section of women writing historical fiction that I feel like all of them are very similar and I don't tend to like, the kind of Stacey Hall's kind of historical fiction. Like, I don't know if it, it would still be one that I would consider to be really good. Vicky Fever, The Handless Maiden, um, is really good, is, is poetry, and I know I like Vicky Fever, but again, I think poetry is definitely one that I need to reread because it because it doesn't have a narrative or characters it is it's much more ephemeral and so it doesn't stick in my mind the same way Vicky Fever in The Handler's Maiden is retelling a lot of myths female perspectives um they're quite dark they're quite body of the body quite visceral um but I don't remember much about it except for the fact that I liked it so definitely think I would need to reread it next I've put Wolf Hall, Bring Up the Bodies and The Mirror and the Light all together even though I think <sighs> I think I would put Wolf Hall at the tip of the top, bring up the bodies at the tip of the top, but the mirror and the lights at a genuine fave. I feel like um, it was slightly too long. So this is a trilogy about Thomas Cromwell, who is from, um, who was like Henry VIII's consigliere. He was his like right hand man. And it starts off with his childhood growing up uh, in working class Putney um, and then becoming the right hand man of Thomas Wolsey and moving into the court. Um, and it follows the various machinations and movements of this court of Henry VIII from that point up until Thomas Cromwell's eventual beheading, um, which is not a spoiler <laughs> because it happened in real life. It's just some of the best writing I've ever read. Really, the way Mantel can describe a room is just like no one else. She has this humour and this sort of wry tenderness to her, the way she writes Thomas Cromwell. He is such an interesting, multi-layered character who um, we, the perspective is so interesting, the way that it is written, the way that he talks. Uh, he, we are thinking through his thoughts with him and then he'll be interrupted by someone um, and then go back to the thoughts with the change of that scene. And it's so immersive and so just brilliant, just so beautiful, so alive, so urgent for being well-known historical history. Um, and I think that it's just brilliant. I definitely need to reread it as well. Um, but I think for me, no books have topped the Cromwell trilogy. If you haven't read Will Fall, I really, really think everyone should, even though I think more people dislike it than like it. Um, it's still, I think it's brilliant. 
Um, and if you are interested in more thoughts, I do have a full review of the trilogy, which you can go and check out. Next, Ali Smith's How To Be Both is definitely another one that I would need to reread. It is one that I again listened to on audiobook, and this time it was a while ago. It is about a young girl, um, and her father has died, and it's about her like grieving and relationship with her mother, relationship with a friend, when possible romantic relationship. Um, and then it is also about an artist in the uh, Renaissance in Italy, um, pretend a woman pretending to be a man. Um, in order to get by but then also like looking at gender um, and I do remember really enjoying it and thinking it was really well written really interesting and engaging um, really thoughtful but it was such a long time ago that I think I would need to reread it to give you a proper like in-depth review. Sally Rooney's Normal People I would put in solid five stars I don't think it's a favorite book of mine but it is definitely one that I felt so emotionally connected to it resonated with me so much the sort of look at uh, it's about, you probably know, it's about Connell and Marianne who are these two people from rural Ireland who then go um, to, who have a relationship with one another um, but keep it secret from their everyone. Um, she is well off, he is poor but they go to school and he is cool and she is not cool, she is like strange and ungainly. Um, and they go to Dublin and it is a lot about like Connell's not fitting in with Trinity because of his class background and his discomfort with that and a lot about like Irish masculinity and the difficulties with talking and opening up um, that are inherent in that. Uh, sex and discomfort and uh, like sex as self-harm. It's a, it's, a, it's a really well written lovely interesting book. Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeleine Tien is another one that I would need to reread because it's so long ago since I read it but I loved that one as well. It is about um, a family in China through like the cultural revolution, the revolution and then the cultural revolution um, and these two people who fall in love and also a young woman who after the Tiananmen Square massacre flees to Canada where she meets this mother and daughter who are somehow related to her and it is about music because a lot of these people are violin players so there is a lot about culture and music and maths and history um but as you can tell i listened to it so long ago that i that no i read it i read it with my eyes um but i read it so long ago that i uh, don't have strong memories of it so the english patient by michael Landacci, i read even longer ago but i would still put it in a genuine fave um i really enjoyed this book i was obsessed with it it's the book that i said was my favorite book before i read the wolf hall trilogy um it is about a collection of people who are in this italian villa in um Italy obviously uh, during the second world war and the Germans have fled and the Italians have fled and like the British are coming and we have this one patient who speaks English and it's called the English patient and the Canadian nurse who is looking after him and a thief who has come as well and a sapper from the British army who is in who is a Sikh Indian man who is in the garden trying to defuse a bomb and so we hear the history of this English patient in Egypt um, before the war and it's is just stunningly written, just gorgeous, really luxurious, luxurious writing. Quite strange. Uh, I definitely think there's a scene near the end that a lot of people really disapprove of. Um, but I just, I really enjoyed it, um, and I found it so moving and captivating. And I think it was one of those, one of the first books that I read where I was like rereading passages and wishing that I could write like that. Um, I read it when I was 17, so um, it was like right at the prime age for me. The Discomfort of Evening by Lucas uh, Reineveld is another one that I would put as a genuine favourite. Another strange, uncomfortable little book about a girl whose brother dies in an ice skating accident and she lives in a rural Christian community in the Netherlands and it is coming to terms with grief and this strange abusive family and the discomfort with one another, with grief um, and the things that you don't talk about. Um, and I found it one of the most like emotionally moving books, not in a like, I'm going to cry, this is uh, like beautifully moving, but as in it made me feel physically sick. Thought it was really stunning, really well written, written really interesting book. 
The next one is Heavy by Casey Lehman, and this one also goes into the tip of the top, uh, which means that the majority of those are non-fiction so far. But um, this is a memoir of Casey Lehman's life growing up as a fat black boy in Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, as the son of a woman who is a professor who is uh, also abusive and forces him to write, and his relationships with himself, with his body, with his identity, and going away to university, and the ways that being a black man from where he's from um, affects the way people view him in the university and then also his relationship to addiction and his body and his mother and a women, other women. Um, just one of the most touching, vulnerable memoirs I've ever read. Um, and again, another book that made me wish I could write like that. Then we have Burnt Sugar by Avni Doshi. I think I would put this one in a solid five stars. Like it's a really solid book but I don't think it's a favourite of mine. It is about a woman who is uh, returning to look after her mother who has dementia um, and they have a difficult relationship because they were involved in a cult that was abusive when she was younger and she was kind of neglected and is now trying to tackle looking after someone who doesn't remember that and doesn't remember the difficulties in their relationship. She's also a an artist who is repainting the same man or redrawing the same man's face every day without reference to a picture of him or the previous picture she's drawn. Um, kind of like a game of telephone with herself. A really like difficult, disconnected, uncomfortable book that really goes into those difficult, uncomfortable emotions and has so much tension and kind of want to put the book down because you feel so like physically uncomfortable a really well done version of this mother daughter thing i don't love books about mothers but i liked this one our wives under the sea by julia armfeld is that the right name that is a genuine fave as well i really really love that one of the few books i cried at last year this is about a woman whose wife has gone on a submarine expedition she comes back and um, changed and so we see this woman grappling with grief and loss and um the loss of love when the person is still there then also see what happened under the water this kind of catabasis that is kind of tense and dark and i just thought it was so wonderfully evocative i really love the style of the writing i thought it was beautiful um and i really really was moved by this one i really loved it um in moved in the traditional sense then we have if Beale street could talk by james baldwin which is another one i think i would have to reread to solidify whether it would be a five star still um it is about trish and funny who are a young couple where the man has been falsely accused of rape and taken to prison and it is an exploration of being black in new york in the 1970s of false accusations and of gender imbalances and of love really powerful love but it's one of those books that the hype was so high that i don't know whether it actually made it to five stars for me or whether i felt like it should howl's moving castle by diana Wynne jones is a solid fave it's a different type of fave to the rest of these it's a really uh fun children's book um about a girl who goes off uh who thinks she cannot make her fortune and is what the curse to be an old woman and ends up having to leave home because of that and encounters a vain welsh wizard in his moving castle with his fire demon and it's just so much fun and i really really enjoyed it a great children's book but not really comparable to the rest of the books on this list sing unburied sing by Jasmine Ward. I think I would put that in a solid five stars. It is another book that made me cry. This is about a family who are traveling to a prison to pick up the father who has just been released and the mother is a drug addict and the son is trying to look hard after his little sister and they live with the grandparents and so we also get flashbacks to the grandfather's uh, time growing up. Um, I, I, I would have, I know that Jasmine Ward is another one with beautiful writing, really, really stunning lyricism, and I love a ghost story, so that would definitely make this speak to me. Intense with the trauma <laughs> for my, for me to 100% love it, just the way that it's written, the way, like, it's, it's not, you know, the discomfort of evening has similar levels of trauma, but it is the way that those things are portrayed i think sometimes makes a difference to me the shadow king by maza mengiste is another one i would need to reread it's about the ethiopians fight for independence after the invasion of the italians in the 1930s um set uh, about guerrilla warfare and this woman who is enslaved um and then has to and um, goes to war and then also this italian jewish um photographer who is in the um in the army but kind of under threat of what will happen to his parents back home and i think i really enjoyed the visual imagery of this one but i don't know if the writing would 100 percent still be five stars in fact i think if i put this one in 
don't know how it got here and James Baldwin because even though and the Mercies even though I do know how they got there they are the ones that I feel less certain about whether I would still give five stars. This Changes Everything by Naomi Klein is a solid five stars. I love Naomi Klein um she's a brilliant non-fiction writer this is her book about capitalism versus the climate and the ways that profit seeking companies that think in the short term really affect climate change um and kind of push for le legislation to not really affect them or to be quite toothless and um she's just so great at synthesizing story with um data and i think that um i have read two other of her books and that is definitely what i feel about all of them um i think she's a really brilliant journalist black movie by Danez smith is another one that i would need to reread for the same reasons as when i was talking about vicky fever um i remember really enjoying the way the rhythms of these poems um and the ways they brought in kind of pop culture and joy to the the themes as well as like really hard-hitting uh book uh, poems about black masculinity in america but i don't have a huge memory the mermaid and mrs hancock is another one that's kind of similar to the mercies it is about a merchant in uh, 18th century london who's a uh, captain of a ship brings back a mermaid um, and they show it as a curiosity and it ends up in a brothel and there is also a sex worker who is down on her luck um who has been brought back into the brothel and those two meet and it is really about like sex work and work in 18th century London um, and really again atmospheric evocative really brilliant at bringing to life that time period but again I think I would have to reread it to see whether it really makes it to five stars again. The Promise by Dam Damon Galbert is another fave of mine I really really enjoyed that when I read it for the Booker Prize shortlist a few years ago it is set in South Africa about a family who a white South African family in outside Pretoria who own land and who the father dies in the 1980s and they promise uh, no the mother dies in the 1980s and makes the father promise to give the house where their black servant lives to their servant it then goes over the course of um South African history through moments that are significant in the family's life that are also significant in the history of South Africa and it, it looks at the promise of, of post-apartheid South Africa and the promises broken um through this one family and I thought that the writing was so like darkly funny and so incisive and specific and I really really enjoyed it it does some interesting things with perspective that I thought was really brilliant The Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver is another one that I would say is a genuine favourite or oh, but again I would need to reread it as well where's it gone there it is um I would need to reread it as well because it's another one I read a long time ago uh this is about a family of missionaries in Congo in the 1950s and 60s there are four daughters and the missionary the father is like a zealot and really obsessive um and it charts the course of Congolese independence through the perspective of these missionaries and the kind of abusive nature of missionary work and looks at colonialism and extractivism in the Congo and Barbara Kingsolver is such a brilliant writer um that I really remember thinking it was beautifully written we also have another Barbara Kingsolver here Demon Copperhead which I would put at the tip of the top um I read it last year so it is uh, a book that I was obsessed with last year it is a retelling of David Copperfield but set in Appalachia in the 1990s and early 2000s following Demon Copperhead and I just think that the character work and the voice of this book is just so some of the best the, some of the best that I've read this character really really comes to life um it's told kind of slightly in Appalachian dialect brings such poetry and music um to the voice and the way that it's telling the story it is quite relentlessly dark but um I really thought it, it did, did a great job um it definitely feels a little like a victorian novel but updated um and i thought yeah i thought it's just brilliant then we have don't touch my hair by emma dabbery i think i would put that in don't know how it got here um it is non-fiction about uh racism through the story of hair and like having good hair as a black person and um hair in relation to like algorithms and hair in various different ways of looking at that looking at time and looking at is as a conceptualized um, as different ways of conceptualizing the world um, and how that differs from like a western conceptualization um, and I remember liking it and obviously uh, because I've put it it's got five stars but I feel like it I think I thought that it wasn't quite so introductory as a lot of the non-fiction I was reading around similar topics at the time it felt like it went a little deeper but I'm not sure um, if it hasn't really stuck with me and I'm not sure if I would still feel that way about it. Cynthia Miller's Honorifics, again I think I'm gonna have to put that in need to reread. It's a collection of poetry about being um, 
third culture kid about being uh, about honorifics and being raised in a Chinese ethnically Chinese family but I believe they're Chinese Malay I can't quite remember um, but it's, it's I remember really really enjoying it but um, I don't remember much else about the poems. The Bee Sting by Paul Murray I am putting at the tip of the top I actually think that was a feat of writing and really really disappointed it didn't win the booker it's, it was amazing um, it is about an Irish family um, and in the 2010s as their like family business is failing um, and it slowly unravels secrets of this family the things that they are hiding from one another but what I love about it is that like there are elements of the thriller there it is so funny it is so captivating page turnery and uncomfortable and yet clever and like really great character development and an old a middle-aged man writing teenage women teenage girls really well that one is one that might like fall slightly further down to a genuine fave in time because it's only been like six months since I read it against white feminism I'm giving a solid five stars um it is about white feminism and about the experiences that um the writer had going to different uh like conferences and things as a as a Pakistani woman and the ways that white feminism has in history and still continues to like infantilize and other pe women who are not white and it looks at feminism in a, in a much more like collective whole way than the sort of individualist white feminism um but i have seen someone talk about plagiarism in that book so i'm not 100 percent sure like i have seen someone talk about it i haven't honestly looked into it so i don't know and then finally uh, Sadie Smith on beauty goes at the tip of the top as well. I love Sadie Smith as a writer. This is another retelling of a classic novel, this time Howard's End by Ian Forster, um, from, uh, which is an Edwardian novel. This time it is about um, two families who are involved in the academic world. They, go, they work at the same university in the North East in America, but our main family, the Belsey family, are um, the, the father is from the UK. The kids grew up in the UK before being moved to America as teenagers. The mother is from Florida. The father is white, the mother is black. From inside this ivory tower, um, from a very specific, like, cultural background but also feeling disconnected from that or wanting like the youngest son wanting an authentic black experience um and also like family relationships and sexual relationships it follows zadie smith's sort of classic meandering plots um that are instead talking about race and class and gender and the intersections of these things um with a very funny witty character driven uh focus and just really brilliant conversations, really great dialogue. Those are all of the books that I have on Storygraph as five stars. Um, I um, definitely need to do some rereading. If there are any in there you'd be interested in seeing me reread and having thoughts about, let me know that in the comments down below. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this video. If there are any surprises there, let me know that too. Um, as I said, I'm not feeling super well, so I'm gonna go now. Um, but thank you very much for watching. If you are new here, my name's Roisin. I put out new videos twice a week. Um, so I will be back very soon with another video. Bye-bye.